me and my brother have to work in the hookah factory. One day, my brother attempted a suicide. He tried to hang himself using his own t-shirt. I wish I had never existed. I feel alone, carrying this heavy burden which had cast my mother a mortal shock. Because yes, she died a few hours after seeing my back, broken by the reps they did to me. Dear audience, during the winter in 2008, I traveled to Phnom Penh in Cambodia. The reason why is I had just done a course in the horrible reality of child trafficking and sex tourism. Around this time, in the beginning of 2000, Southeast Asia were considering the source country for child trafficking. And I really wanted to go there to understand the mechanism behind it. And I really wanted to try to understand something that is nearly impossible to grasp. Together with a dear friend, I visited a center for girls that had been freed from sex trafficking. The stories these girls told me was so hard to hear. Today, I don't really remember their names, but I will never forget their looks in their eyes. And I will never forget the, th the things that they told me. I especially remember one girl who I had a short conversation with just, just exactly when I was about to leave the center. The way she walked up to me and how she looked at me, nothing I have ever experienced has affected me more than that darkness in her eyes. You know, there was that kind of look that once you have seen it, you can never turn your back to it. But she was not a broken girl. She was maybe 10, 11 years old. She looks just so much younger. But she came up to me and she said that for the first time, as long as she can remember, at the center, she was allowed to play again. And she even started to tell me stories about the games that she played, and she invited me to join her. And when she played, I saw her strength, her creativity, her sense of humor, and it all kind of came alive when she started to play. In preparing for this year's Shai Ten Summit, I have once again seen the look that I saw in that girl's eye. But this time, I did not need to travel all the way to Southeast Asia. I have seen it in the eyes of refugee children who I met in the parks in some of the most beautiful cities in Europe. In Paris, in Athens, in Naples, and also here in Malmö. The voices you just heard, now there were voices from two of these children that we met in preparation for this summit. Children who have fled their home countries in the search for a better life, but instead being pushed into the hands of traffickers. Children who have suffered horrendous experience of abuse and exploitation in their home country, on their journeys to Europe, and here again, in Europe. Children 
in the hands of Europe. The children that we constantly fail. Dear audience, I would say that we are living in a very special time in history. We are living in a time when we, as a continent, are not able to agree on how to treat people who seek refugee here, how to protect the rights that they are entitled to, their human rights. The inability is creating a vacuum, a shadow world in which these children is forced to live in. We are also living in a country, in a continent, that is actually kind of implementing policies that are designed to make people afraid of coming here. We are implementing policies designed to scare the most vulnerable children and youth away, to scare them to even dreaming of coming here to us, to Europe. But as you all know, you can never scare a child away of dreaming. From fighting for her or his life. So in reality, we are instead forcing them into darkness, into disappearing under the radar. And in one way, we are kind of serving the most vulnerable children and youth on a silver tray to traffickers, to smugglers, and to criminal networks. Did you know that statistics show that 30,000 refugee children have been lost in Europe the last few years? Young children, small children, children that can be 5, 8, 11, 17 years old, who have disappeared, untraceable, nowhere to be found, without protection from, protection from trafficking, exploitation or abuse. The real number is also probably higher. But the truth is, we don't know exactly how many they are for that very reason, that they are, they are not traced and they are not looked for. Exactly like the black toys that you saw outside here, representing all the lost children. In many of the children that I have met in the preparation for tonight, I have seen the same kind of incredible strength that I saw in that girl's eyes in Cambodia. The strength to actually manage to turn things around. But then we need to listen to them, and we need to treat them like children. So, honoring guest, my name is Sara Damber, and I would like to welcome you all to the Child 10 Award of 2020. And this evening, we will celebrate individuals who, have looked, who never have looked away or actually stopped caring. We will award 10 bold individuals and organizations who fight tirelessly to save children from trafficking. Individuals who often work with limited funds and under difficult conditions to protect the most vulnerable ch children in our communities. But before, before we sort of embark on this journey of this evening, I also want you to understand why we think it's so important that we have this award here in Malmö. So I would like to present the host for tonight uh, and a strong supporter to Child 10, the Deputy Mayor of Malmö, Sedat Arif. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is this working? Yes. Uh, dear friends, uh, I'm honored to welcome you all to the city of Malmö. My name is uh, Sedat Arif and I'm the Deputy Mayor uh, of Malmo, and I'm responsible for social welfare and a labor market here in this city. Malmo is the most uh, is one of the most global cities in the world. 186 nationalities are represented within our population, and approximately 33 percent of the city's inhabitants were born abroad. There is a great strength in that. It's also one of the things I love about the city. It's global and vibrant. The food, the culture, event, the beaches, 
during the summertime in many beautiful parks. There is much to love. But Malmo is not only that. I keep thinking about Surawi. She was only 14 years old when she came to Sweden together with her husband. Swedish authorities believed that she was older since her husband had written down an older age in their papers. She was a victim of child marriage. She worked in her husband's restaurant where she worked for free for many years. Later on, she managed to flee from her abusive husband and together with her kid. I trust some of you have read the huge article about Surawi written by Johanna Carlson in Expression a couple of weeks back. If not, I recommend you to read that article. The, that whole article paints a picture of a context where sham, sham marriage, slavery, child marriage, violence, exploitation, and shady businesses and illegal economic activities are a normal part of everyday life. The sad story took place in Malmo. This is a small part of society, but it has an effect on the rest of us. But most of all, it has an effect on those who are abused within the system. Therefore, we as a city work together with the police and other public authorities against the black market and these types of shady criminal sector for a long time to shut them down. We need to continue that work and we will not give them a moment of peace, that I promise you. Last year, I spoke a bit on how honestly believe a lot in working together in alliances, and that's what we have done in our city, working between the different sectors to find these restaurants. And we need also more information from the people that visit all the restaurants here in Malmo when they get the information. The public sector will do its part, but we also need to be able to give strength to those who carry ideas and engagement outside the public sphere. Cooperation with strong values, labor unions, NGOs, who are trying to change society for the better, and individuals who lead for change. Help is of great and crucial importance to them. Therefore, I'm personally honored to have a very small part in this award ceremony. It's a way of giving credit where the credit is due to advocates for children who work tirelessly for improving life situation for the most vulnerable in our societies. These leaders deserve attention for their work and I'm very happy that this once again takes place in Malmo. With that short introduction, I would like to welcome you once again to Malmo and thank you very much for listening. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Thank you Sarah. Six years ago, I founded Child 10 together with a great entrepreneur, Sophie Steenbeck. And I'm very proud to say that Child 10 has grown with the sole purpose of breaking the vicious circles of child trafficking. The work will be led by our Secretary General, Jacob Flad who is also the one who has been running the summit the last couple of days here in Malmö with the awardees. So please join me to welcome Jacob up on the stage. So, so as I said, I mean, this award ceremony is a part of a longer uh, event that's been going on for a few days. Can you please share with us what have ha happened? Yeah, so during Saturday and Sunday, all the awardees arrived here in Malmö. And uh, on lunch Sunday, we started this uh, Child 10 Summit for this year. In order to meet and share our experience and discuss joint challenges to, and identify the best practices and find new solutions. And also because all, all of the 10 awardees for these years are working to protect the lives of children in an environment with growing xenophobic and racist narrative. And they are often exposed to threats, hate, and severe pressure in the environment they operate in. 
So our goal is to inspire, boost, and speed up their work to end these violations for rights of the children. So during these days, we have had uh, several workshops. We have discussed about resilience for you as an individual, for your staff and your organization. Mm -hmm. We have talked about impact measurement. We have talked about advocacy. Uh, and we also had uh, yesterday a problem-solving workshop where all the LEDs uh, had a possibility to sit down for a couple of hours with selected experts targeting their specific, one of their specific core challenges. Yeah. And recently, just two hours ago, uh, we finalized uh, the last part of this summit with a solution-oriented uh, workshop shared by the intergroup of uh, children's rights in the European Parliament on collaborative advocacy. Mm. And some of the, the, I mean, both from the solution workshop, but also the, the advisors from the problem-solving workshop, is many of them are here to celebrate with us tonight. Um, can you tell us a little bit more also about the theme that you have decided to focus on this year and also what is important going forward? Well, I would like to say that uh, during the last years, the conditions for children seeking protection in Europe has deteriorated rapidly. Since the borders closed, children are forced to seek more dangerous routes and are at high risk for trafficking and exploitation. And the numbers you mentioned earlier, I would say that they are increasing every day. Every day, children go missing in this system. So there is an urgent need to find new child protection systems. Mm. Because when the official child protection system fails, mm. there are individuals and organizations like them you will meet today that are the only safe places. And we need, together, all of us, find urgent measures. We need to gather organi non-governmental organizations. We need to gather official systems. We need to gather the most powerful decision makers and find solutions, and we need to do it as now as possible. Yeah, for sure. Um, the award is, I mean, beside the opportunity to be here, what is actually the award that they, I mean, what, what is the award that the award is received? Uh, all the awardees will receive a financial grant from Child 10 on, on 10,000 uh, US dollars. Yeah. Uh, but besides that, and besides all the things I recently mentioned that we have done during this day, it's mm -hmm. actually now that the work starts. Mm -hmm. uh, because we will work together with the awardees and their organization in the upcoming years to support them, to scale their impact and become more sustainable, and also to support them in collaborative ways to increase uh, the protection net around med the Mediterranean region. Right, thank you very much. We are very excited to, to, to meet the awardees. But, and I think a great, great introduction to that is that I will now welcome up our musical guest, Anne Brun, on stage. And she is also very engaged in human rights issues. And she's here tonight to show her support to our course. So please welcome Anne Brun on the stage. Everything comes from something It all starts with one It all starts somewhere It all starts with one 
Nothing comes from nothing It all starts with one First everything is dry Before the dew and the drops are Then the rain starts falling down Then comes the flood The flood Try the flood, the flood, the flood. We all start somewhere, we all start with one. Everything comes from something, we all start with one. We all Start somewhere, we all start with one. No one comes from nothing, we all start with one. First, everything is quiet, a breath of air from lips and tongue. Then the sound makes the world one. Storms from dust, anger from fear, poetry from heartbeats, revolution from dreams, revolution from dreams, revolution from dreams. It all starts somewhere, it all starts with one. Everything comes from something It all starts with one Starts with one <laughs> Wonderful, thank you very much, Anne. To introduce the awardees and to their work, and to understand the reality of exploitation and trafficking, we will be taking you on a journey tonight. But I want to warn you in advance, there will not be a pleasant journey. We will be traveling along a path of bordering by pain and darkness. But of course, throughout this journey, our awardees will serve as beacons of light to show us that there are ways to help these children and there are ways to break the vicious circles of exploitation. On the map behind me, you can see the most common migrant routes but of course, it's not all of the migrants' routes, because if we put them up here, we won't even see the map. For many children on the run, the countries on the map here is where the journey starts. For others, the journey has started much, much earlier. And countries behind them will be the transit countries and they need, that they need to pass through on their way to Europe. Many of these children who are transiting through these countries have already traveled a long way at the mercy of traffickers. They may have been packed up into a pickup truck or driving through the extreme heat in the desert or maybe risk their life on the top 
on the roof on a train. The stories from people travel this way are filled with testimonials of rape, beating, fear, thefts, extortion, and lack of food and water. If you travel alone, if you lack education, and if you undertake a longer journey, you are also statistically even more vulnerable. And the most vulnerable in transit countries are those who come from sub-Saharan Africa. Reports indicate as many as two-thirds of adolescent refugees from sub-Saharan suffer exploitation on the way to Europe, a rate over four times higher than refugee children and youth from other regions. Also in detention camps, people from different African countries are treated far worse and often exposed to racist abuse and discrimination. So this is the reality which a number of our Child 10 awardees operate in a dark, sometimes hopeless situation that they really need to represent the light and the hope. So it is now my great honor to introduce the first Child 10 awardees of the evening. Thousands of children live in dangerous situations in countries where they have sought protection, desperately in need of finding a safe place. Since 2005, Refuge Point has directly assisted more than 50,000 refugees to access resettlement programs and completed referrals for almost 2,000 children at risk. Martin Anderson has dedicated his career to improving the lives of refugees. As director of international programs at Refuge Point, Martin and his organization, working closely with UNHCR and others, have developed child protection and resettlement programs in many countries across Africa and the Middle East. These programs seek to ensure that refugee children have access to the support programs and lasting solutions they need. Please welcome the Director of International Programs at Refuge Point, Martin Anderson. Welcome up here, Martin. So, I mean, in the video, you have uh, you said that you have supported thousands of vulnerable children in this region with resettle resettlement programs. Can you tell a little bit about what does that mean and what is a resettlement program? Oh, that would be good, I suppose. Welcome. Can you hear me? So, Sarah, I think the first thing that I have to do is to express um, my very sincere disappointment that my last name, in fact, has only one S in it. And though I appreciate the fact that you've made me a little more Swedish for the evening, I am, in fact, uh, American, as you, as you can hear. Uh, but I do appreciate the, the temporary upgrade. Thank you. <laughs> and then I also wanted to say, um, of course, thank you to you, Sarah, to everyone at Child 10 to all of the other awardees. And then while I'm at it, to my wife Natalie and my son Desmond, who are here with us as well. It's a real honor and, and opportunity to be here. So okay. thank you to everyone. Thank you. And to all of you too, I should have said most importantly. Thank you all. Now, to answer your question about resettlement. Yes. In in principle, it's quite simple and straightforward, though in practice it can often be very complicated. In principle, resettlement is simply the idea of identifying those refugees who cannot survive where they're currently living, and then, uh, and for whatever reason that might, might be, and that includes many, many thousands of unaccompanied children, separated children, other children at risk, 
identifying them, those children at need, wherever they happen to be living, and linking them with the opportunities to relocate permanently to a safe new home. That's often in Europe and North America, Australia and New Zealand, but other places too. Identifying people who need that opportunity and making it happen. That's, that's what we do and that's what resettlement is. And then I think you asked, pardon me, go ahead. Mm. No, but can you tell us a little bit more, like more concrete, how is the process? I mean, what do you do? So we at Refuge Point have staff working in refugee camps and urban environments around Africa and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And they are actively working with UNHCR and other partners. And it's very important to stress the contributions of local partners in all of these places, working with those partners to identify the children who are otherwise on that migration route that we've just seen on the map working their way towards Europe in such dangerous circumstances, working to identify them before they expose themselves to all of those dangers and make those links, like I said, to resettlement and other migration opportunities that they are eligible for and that they need so desperately. Yeah. So, I mean, from, from your point of view, I mean, we are talking a lot, and we have been talking a lot about that during these days. I mean, since like 2016, the media attention around this whole uh, problem is much, much lower. Um, and what, I mean, what would you say about the situation right now when it comes to trafficking? How has it changed the last, just the last few years? Yeah, I feel like I need to start by admitting that I am, I am absolutely not an expert on global trafficking or anti-trafficking. And so let me focus here, please, on one aspect of this that um, I've experienced in my own work and yeah. that therefore I know comfortably. We've been working with UNHCR and other partners over the past couple of years to identify refugee children in detention in Libya mm -hmm. and to evacuate them from Libya to other countries in Africa where they can then live safely while their resettlement uh, applications are processed for, for resettlement to a safe new home. It is a critical program. It is very literally a life-saving program for many uh, hundreds and now thousands of children. However, what we've recently seen is that some children, a small number, but some children are now starting to actively seek detention in Libya in order to access the resettlement opportunity on the other side of detention in Libya. And I, I mention that not in any way to undermine your faith in that program. Like I said, it is a critical program. It is a life-saving program. Mm -hmm. I mention that simply to stress that it is, it's complicated and our interventions are complicated. And we have to be careful about how we intervene and the unintended consequences of our interventions. Mm -hmm. And so at Refuge Point, we're working not just on resettlement, but also on self-reliance opportunities for refugees in the countries where they currently are so that hopefully don't, they don't feel so compelled to undertake those desperate journeys across the Sahara to the Mediterranean and onwards towards, towards Europe. I think when you hear, I mean, when we hear about the situation and all the stories that, I mean, we will be told and has been told during this, after, this evening, um, you feel so, I mean, you really want to help. What, what can we do? I mean, people are here from corporates, from authorities, from organizations and... and human rights fighters, I mean, mixed group of people. What kind of advice, I mean, yeah. Well, I think first and foremost, it's quite obvious that everyone here has taken uh, a big and important, at least first step by being here tonight, by yeah. supporting Child 10 mm. and the, the wonderful work that you do. Um, I think it would be remiss of me, or at least a missed opportunity, not to highlight the fact that we have 10 awardee organizations here, all of which would appreciate whatever support you're able to offer. But then I think, too, um, you know, at this moment in time, like you and Jacob described earlier, mm -hmm. it's important to stress the principle behind the expression of thinking globally but acting locally. Mm -hmm. So much of uh, the work that we all do on the ground uh, all over the world, frankly, mm -hmm. is very heavily influenced by domestic politics in Europe and in each individual European country. And so anything that you can do to influence your local politics, even right here in Malmo, even right here in mm. Sweden, uh, that has real impact, real consequences. And it does help us uh, when you can make the case and make the point that we do need to protect these, these children at risk. Mm. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I will ask you to stay here in the in the or actually move over to the chair, and we will invite two more awardees. Thank you very much, Martin. <laughs> so we will we'll now move towards Turkey, who geographical position make it. it makes it the first reception and transit country for millions of refugees and migrants. With the growing number of Syrian refugees, Turkey now hosts the largest refugee population in the world. Many of them are living in horrendous condition without basic services like water, food, shelter, and the situation is going from bad to worse, and the children, as always, are the ones suffering the most. For many children, the exploitation starts in Turkey, and child trafficking is a widely spread problem there. Two of our awardees this year are brave enough to stand up for these children, working tirelessly to improve their lives, working in an extremely difficult political situation. So please welcome Eski. The substantial refugee population in Turkey is extremely vulnerable to trafficking and exploitation and children are at particular risk. Ezgi Yaman is a highly committed child protection advocate. Her organization, the NGO's Network Against Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children in Turkey, Ekpat Turkey, is focused on training children to protect themselves, providing them with crucial knowledge on how to identify traffickers and where to get help and find protection. Eski believes that change can be made through a combination of advocacy, working with government officials, and engaging in on-the-ground support to the most vulnerable children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from the organization NGOs Network Against Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children in Turkey, Ekpat Turkey, Eski Yaman. And we would also like to welcome Gungur up to the stage. Turkey hosts a large refugee population, and the fight against human trafficking is mainly carried out by security and migration authorities. There are very few non-government organizations involved in this work, especially ones focused on child trafficking and child victims. Gunjo Chabuk is the founding member of Family Counselors Association, an organization responsible for training thousands of key professionals working with trafficking of human beings. As one of the leading experts on child trafficking in Turkey, Gunjo is regularly called upon to provide advice to government institutions her efforts have resulted in a more systematic approach towards trafficking in Turkey, and she loves to spread and share her knowledge and experience, helping to improve the situation of the most vulnerable of children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome one of the founders of Family Counselors Association, Gunyar Çabuk. question for you, Eski. I mean, I just said that almost three million refugees in Turkey, more than any other country in the world. Can you tell us a little bit more about the risk that the refugee children face when they come to Turkey? Yeah, um, yes, um, what is it? Okay. Um, 
Yes, uh, I, uh, but first I would tell two sentences in Swedish. Um, Jag vill tacka Charten och alla ni som är här i Moriska Pavilionen. Uh, tack så mycket för denna möjlighet. Oh, wow! <laughs> Super! Well done! Thank you. Thank you so much again yeah. for this opportunity to be here. And uh, yeah, uh, Turkey is um, uh, almost uh, has uh, over six million uh, Syrian refugee, uh, and also thousands of uh, from other countries, from Afghanistan mm -hmm. and uh, Pakistan and many uh, other countries. And uh, despite the all efforts uh, of the Turkish government, European Union, uh, UN agencies, and all the global support. Uh, refugee children in Turkey are still facing uh, difficult, with many difficulties in access to health and mm. education services and uh, poverty and uh, most, most importantly uh, the risk of child trafficking and sexual exploitation. Mm. And uh, there are many cases that, um, uh, such as children being uh, sold in exchange uh, for money or even for rent Mm -hmm. uh, to pay uh, the rent out to landlords and um, uh, illegally uh, and forcibly married uh, with adults and also being used in prostitution. So mm -hmm. these are the main risks uh, that children uh, are facing in Turkey. You said in the film that you are empowering children to protect themselves from trafficking. So how do you do that? How do you empower children to do that? Um, it's very important for children to know their rights and uh, feel empowered and uh, make decisions about themselves. So we are trying to focus on that and therefore we provide children with trainings on child rights, uh, child trafficking and sexual abuse, uh, risk factors and uh, ways of protection. And uh, we are, uh, uh, just last year we educated almost 2,000 uh, children Mm -hmm. And also we have uh, peer support groups mm -hmm. uh, in 12, uh, 12 cities uh -huh. uh, for children to be empowered and to create their own uh, campaigns and raise their own voices uh -huh. to um, uh, go further mm -hmm. for the future. And also we are uh, training parents and uh, professionals who are working with children like social workers, teachers, lawyers uh, in the justice system and also we are doing uh, advocacy campaigning with them. Mm. Impressive. Thank you very much. I think maybe you take this one. Um. So, dear Gungor, you said in the video you are often engaged by government institutions to advise on policies to fight child trafficking. What would you say is the most important advice to give to these institutions and individuals on how to prevent child trafficking? Uh, hello, everybody. Firstly, my English isn't good. Uh, sorry about it. Uh, I study my question. Uh, there is an ongoing system about child protection quite well in Turkey. Uh, however, uh, in this system, there isn't an entry which supports the uh, child victim. Uh, my most important offer was uh, to raise awareness on, on uh, child trafficking yeah. and uh, to add child trafficking entry into child protection system. Mm. Thank you. I mean, we have heard a lot of sad stories, and we have heard a lot of shocking statistics. Uh, are there any words of hope that you can share? Uh, uh, the most important uh, part of the human life is childhood. Children must, life, uh, must live their childhood like a child. Why? Uh, as while working uh, with the victims, their stories made me ashamed uh, of myself. Uh, I realized that I could touch their life and I could change uh, it. I believe that 
we all can do something uh, for their uh, for those children thank you i'm wondering actually to both to all of you uh, um how do you feel to spend like i think it's like three days together with fellow colleagues working with the same topic from different countries in the world what would you say ask uh, i would say it was really empowering for me um we were uh, ten yeah, change. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> for that. Uh, I would say it was really empowering for me uh, to meet with uh, my uh, nine other awardee colleagues mm -hmm. and um, also uh, work with the Child 10 team. Uh, the um, workshops uh, like problem solving workshops, social uh, solution oriented workshops and uh, impact measurement, many others uh, were very helpful and inspiring mm. and uh, I think it will help me to go further and it gave me a hope to go further mm. uh, to um, enhance my work. Yeah. What would you say, Martin? What would you be the sort of main advice that you have got the last few days? Well, a moment ago, you had asked Gunker about um, you know, if she has hope. And I found myself thinking that uh, it was the past three days that, um, among, among other things, I guess, but the past three days have certainly been an example mm -hmm. of why we should all have hope. Because there are uh, such good people and such good organizations out there working to combat um, child trafficking and exploitation. And so that gives me hope. Yeah, yeah Google. Yes. Uh, I study only my question, but uh, Ezgi uh, now helped me. Uh, I feel so empowered that we spent time together and uh, it was really a kind of solidarity. Yeah. Nice. Thank you very much, all three of you. A warm applause again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's time for another performance by Arne Brun. And this is Martin Hederus. Don't be unhappy, can't remember when 
I saw you laugh If this world makes you crazy And you're taking all you get You call me up Because you know I'll be there And I see your true colors Shining through I see your true colors And that's why I love you So don't be So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you also know that you can start eating of the things that you have in front of you. I have forgot to tell you that. <laughs> they remind me all the time I go down, but then I forget again, so I'm sorry. So please help yourself. Sorry. So now our journey has taken us to the European continent. The Mediterranean countries of the continent are the gateway for the most refugees coming here. And it is here that we will meet this year's next five shy turn abodies. Just getting to Europe means that you are one of the lucky ones, as many lives are lost crossing the sea. You will likely have been traveling at the mercy of smugglers for several weeks or several months. And even if you are being lucky enough to get this far, chances are that your luck will end here, in an, in an inhumane refugee camp, lacking everything, medicine, toilets, everything, and kind of waiting to be thrown out again, back to the place that is no longer your home, and with the cruelty of Europe forever engraved in your soul. Because of the overpopulation in the camps, many children end up outside, homeless, with no protection whatsoever. And if you are one of the few girls who get this far, you will likely disappear in a few days, not registered anywhere and not looked for by anyone. And you know what? What actually kind of hurts me the most is that you will probably have met countless of people in different professions on your way here. I mean, people who actually could have done something to help you. From my perspective, there are so many individuals who, has, who had the chance to see you and to help you, but didn't. Maybe because they just didn't care enough. Or maybe because they lack the courage to speak up and fight for human rights for these children. Or maybe they simply are like paralyzed and that they are nothing that they feel that they can do or nothing that can be done because of the broken child protection system. So instead, most likely, you as a child, you end up in these meetings and you be forced to retell and relive your story about abuse over and over and over again without ever really, really getting listened to, without ever getting the support or the protection you need. Until maybe one day it just hurts too much to say it again. So instead, you just stop talking. So let us hear from some of the people that actually do see these children and do something. Those who take their hands and lead them through the broken child system. So now we're going to meet Sophia.
Greece is currently the main point of entry into Europe for refugees and migrants. And the overcrowded and unsafe camps and reception centers force many to live on the streets. Home, a Greek nonprofit organization, ensures the sustainability of 11 shelters for unaccompanied minors in Athens. Removing children from hazardous environments, protecting them from trafficking and other forms of exploitation, while also helping to integrate them into society. Sofia Kozlaki's strong passion and supportive leadership to create sustainable long-term impact for children involving the local community transcends beyond her work. Her organization, The Home Project, consists of people dedicated to protect and support unaccompanied children and to challenge the hostile narrative on migrants and refugees in Greece. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the CEO of The Home Project, Sophia Kovlaki. And Nantina. living conditions for children living in Greek refugee camps lead to serious emotional and post-traumatic disorders. Nantina Sikeri is a strong and committed advocate for children's rights. In her role as Director of Defense for Children International Greece, she provides direct legal services and support to children in urgent need, investigating and documenting children's rights violations and litigating strategically to bring social change. Nantina works on the ground with the most vulnerable children, intercepting them on the streets, in the parks, and at the camps. With her strong child rights perspective, she's a role model for children's rights advocates and lawyers all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the director of Defense for Children International Greece, Nantina Sikari. And Jonas. Deficiencies in the child protection systems in Greece have led to a high risk of trafficking, exploitation, and abuse of minors. The Greek Forum of Refugees is an organization by refugees for refugees and was established by Yonas Mohamedi, a passionate child protection advocate who himself arrived in Greece as an asylum seeker. Through his organization, Jonas has created a community for refugees of all nationalities, where they can work together towards a stronger inclusion in their host societies and encourage active participation and recognition of refugees as contributors to an inclusive and democratic society. Jonas has a strong commitment to make a difference and to ensure the rights and protection of all refugees, in particular, the children. For Jonas, it's not a choice, it's a calling. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the founder of the Greek Forum of Refugees, Jonas Mohamedi. Hello. Welcome up on stage. So you all operate in Greece. So I thought it was nice to gather you so we can talk a little bit about the situation in Greece. I mean, since uh, last year, 2019, I know that the number of refugees crossing the sea coming to Greece has actually doubled. So, Sofia, 
what would you say is the main risk that young, a young person who travels this way faces? Um, first of all, thank you very much, Sarah and uh, Jacob and all the team of the Child 10 for, for honoring us. Uh, it's an extreme uh, pleasure and an honor to be here. We're very grateful on behalf of all the team of the Home Project. Um, now, um, as regards to your question, um, as we speak, uh, there are more than 5,600 unaccompanied children in mm -hmm. Greece. Of those, uh, right at this moment, around 4,000 are homeless, mm -hmm. which means they're in the streets, in camps, uh, in detention. I mean, uh, there are eight, nine, and 10-year-olds who are on the islands of, of Le uh, the islands of Lesbos and Samos, which are the entry points of Greece. Mm -hmm. They live alone, in, tent in tents, literally in the mud. Mm -hmm. uh, suffering from skin diseases, beaten by rats, exposed to all sorts of dangers from child abuse to uh, trafficking to sexual exploitation. And if a child is not placed into a shelter, she or he cannot begin to receive any kind of service nor any information on their rights. So it's of utmost urgency that we include these children into the child protection system, because if not, they will remain invisible. Um, yeah. So this is what we try to do at the Home Project. We try to create a child protection structure to make these mm. children vis visible and provide to them the right to be children again. Yeah, but I'm wondering how do you sort of regain the trust to these children? I mean, they have been disappointed so many times about from adults. I mean, how do you regain that? I mean, how, how do you approach these children? Uh, with a very specific child protection model um, that includes a holistic network of, of services. Yeah. Uh, anything that a child needs covering their basic needs, but also giving huge emphasis on mental health, mm. social support, education, but also um, job creation, for the ones who become 18. And of course, uh, legal support, which Nadina will uh, yeah. develop more. Yeah. For their asylum applications and their, the family re reunifications with, with relatives and parents in other countries in Europe. Yeah. But Nadina, I mean, let, let me ask kind of the same question to you. I mean, I know that you are out in camps and on the streets and in the park and try to reach these kids. I mean, how do you, how do you sort of approach them? How do they know that they can trust you? Um, and also tell us a little bit about um, what is the condition that they are living in? I mean, w what is that you see when you go out on the street? Thank you for your questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will take the moment also to thank you, Child Then for really giving us a chance to put a spotlight on this issue, because indeed these children are invisible. Our work is a reflection of their predicament, and by putting the spotlight on us, then you help us also become visible and these children as well. Yeah. So I'm deeply grateful to all of you, and thank you. So now coming back to your question, I would say that um, the living conditions they find themselves in are far away from what is promised to them by the smugglers. Yeah. And I will give you a very concrete example that comes also from Lesbos. There at the moment, there are more than 1,000 children out of the existing camp, the official protection system, mm. that they live in a sort of cold jungle, behind the trees, behind the rocks, without anyone to take care of them. We, we were on a mission a couple of weeks ago there, trying to identify them, to meet them, and to help them proceed with their family reunification processes, because most of them have family members in other countries as Sweden as well. Yeah. So we met them, and the most important thing that happened there was the connection, because they were given the chance, I believe for first time since they arrived in Europe, to be seen, to be heard, mm -hmm. to be understood, to feel someone who has compassion towards them. And I think this is the key tool when you work with the children on the ground. And I think that you will all agree with it, that you, you show them how much you care and you respect mm. their pledge and their story. It's very hard for me to forget when an accompanied boy from Afghanistan, 15 years old, that we met on the ground floor of a venue, having our first connection and interview, and I asked him, 
could you please tell me what's the thing that you mostly need at the moment? And his reply shocked me. He said, I need water. Mm. I've never come across such an answer before in my professional life. And I said, why? Because you know, in order to, get in, in, to go and get clear water, I need to risk myself. I need to risk my life because I might be ra raped on the way. Mm. So these are the living yeah. conditions and the way we approach them. We try yeah. to make them feel that we care, we do care about them. I mean, you are also a lawyer, mm -hmm. and uh, can you say something about what that means when it comes to the legal protection? Mm. Actually, the children disappear mm. exactly because there is no legal protection in yeah. place, I would say. Mm. These children are invisible, are real ghosts in the streets, you go in the, city, in the city center of Athens and you see them walking around as ghosts because there is no protected protection system and legal provision for them. The truth is that this invisibility creates infrastructure for exploitation and trafficking. Yeah. By providing legal assistance to them and support means that you enable them to get back in a context of normality. Mm. to proceed with durable solutions such as family reunification, asylum procedures, relocation, uh, protection from exploitation. Yeah. We actually, with the legal protection, we help them become visible. And believe me, I do believe that every time a child from invisible becomes visible, mm. the entire world gains in humanity, mm. actually. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So, Yunus, dear Yunus, um, as I mean, as we can tell from the video, you are right as an asylum seeker yourself, and today you help others in similar situation. Can you please tell us a little bit about your personal story and also how you built up this organization? Uh, thank you very much, Sophia. First, thank you as founder of this uh, organization, this child team. And thanks all your colleagues and all the people that they organized this. And uh, it is really important for us. We know very well that, of course, the problems are as big that we cannot solve it. But uh, we are trying to just limit the consequences of yeah. these problems that it exists. And uh, it is really important. It is a motivation for us that, that put us trying more and more. That yeah. is the most important for us. But let me also to share uh, with you m my dream, which is a common dream, I think, a common dream with maybe with all of, uh, with all of us here. Mm -hmm. It is a dream that uh, uh, one day there is no need of awarding people for, uh, mm -hmm. for such activities in, in Europe. Uh, in a Europe of 21st century, in a Europe of economic growth, in a Europe with human right values, that it is the center of uh, and the, the, the cause of making this Europe, and the dream that one day that we have institutions, governments here to be awarded for the job they should do, and we should be down and clapping them. That is, <laughs> that's my dream, also, and I, it is the most important thing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, Coming to your question, yes, me as asylum seeker, mm. as a refugee, as millions of refugees that we are, mm. uh, that they are forced to leave their homelands, and I came also uh, to Greece. I'm actually uh, originally from Afghanistan, from a very far village of Afghanistan, a poor village, and I have grown up in a war zone mm. with war, and I came the, a long journey of five years of seeking yeah. protections, and finally I found myself in Greece. In Greece. Uh, it was a difficult time, even more than difficult what is now, that we were sleeping in the park mm. uh, with thousands of other asylum seekers and refugees. But there was a question for us that how we refugees, we ourselves, how we can organize ourselves as communities, as peoples, as parts of this European society that we, we feel this responsibility to share uh, and to contribute in this, what is no. going on in this society. And with my colleagues, we started to organize the communities and finally the Greek form of refugees that I, I represent. And here, really, I feel the responsibility to, to thank my colleagues, I the know. people that they were with me. Mm. And I'm happy that I have two heroes today here. Yeah. And two women, two mothers, and actually two heroes, 
that as refugees, they, they, were, they had children also, and they had their problems on the street, and they were with me, and they were running every day. And a mom from Afghanistan by the name of Jasmine, that, he, that she is here <laughs> also, and also a mom, a mother from Syria, which she had a health problem. Unfortunately, she couldn't come here, and she is living in Malmo. And her daughter came here, Salma, that she is also here. And they need really a clapping for, from us that they are day and night, they were beside me and all the others, and they were trying to help us. And it is the story of the Greek form of refugees that we, mm. refugees, we ourselves start to, to do yeah. that. As you said, the idea for us is that refugees and migrants uh, should not be considered just as receivers of help, as beneficiaries, but as parts of solutions and as parts of the society, it is the most important. And yeah. all of us together, it is need to, to go ahead for the most vulnerable uh, uh, parts of the society, which is uh, uh, the children. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, all of you. Thank you very much. So we will soon move on on our journey, but I am very, very happy to be able to invite, uh, invite on stage the children choir of Malmö Flickkör. So welcome up on stage.
Wow, thank you very much, all of you. Powerful. I know that you all are between. I think Jasmine, you told me they are kind of applying to join the choir from year when they go to the fifth year in, in school up to high school. So it's all ages of strong women, becoming women. So now we will meet the final two Shai Ten awardees from the European continent. So I think we start. I don't know if I actually missed the card or if we're just going to go straight to the film. <laughs> Let's, I think we start with the film. Let's introduce Aiko from Italy. is a destination, transit, and source country for migrants subjected to sex trafficking and forced labor. And unaccompanied minors are especially at risk. Glaucor Yamano and his organization Deadless Social Cooperative in Naples has supported more than 4,000 unaccompanied minors in Italy over the last 10 years. Today, the Daedalus Youth Center welcomes 30 to 40 children and youth every day many whom are able to get access to higher education and employment due to the help they receive. By focusing on the integration of young migrants, Glauco wants to create a narrative where children arriving in Italy are seen as contributors and not as threats. Under the leadership and commitment of Glauco, children and youth are guided towards a path of legality, inclusion and opportunity, protecting them from the risk of being trafficked or exploited. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, from the organization Daedalus Social Cooperative, Glauco Yamano. Welcome to have a seat here, Glaco. So, yeah, you can sit here, close to me. So you take a microphone. Yes, perfect. You okay? <laughs> Just a bit emotional. Yeah. So, I mean, it was said also in the film that you are working with changing the narrative. Uh, so tell me a little bit about that. I mean, how do you do that? And how, how I mean, how can we do that? How can there is no f a single formula? I can explain my my experience, but logically I would like to just a bit. Uh, yes, thank you for all your work. Uh, thank you for your presence here to take care of our uh, work, daily work, and uh, also I appreciate a lot uh, the the witness of my colleagues that now in three days we we appreciate each other's and we are we know. Uh, our daily work, and I hope, uh, and I hope, I'm sure that we will continue to do also with your support. Mm. And this is linked to the narrative because um, we have to manage to doing our inclusion daily work with all the activities mm. to our users uh, uh, from the street until the job, passing from uh, education, socializing, legal support inclusion uh, in school uh, and lots and lots and lots of other activities and uh, but uh, in, in the in the, at the same time we try to uh, give our with our work with our with the their voice and with the at, at different level the public level the private level in the street mm. we try to communicate uh, that this narrative that we are having now is a bad and worse that that this not convenient also. Mm. 
but uh, we are talking uh, with uh, at a different level, with the different ways, with the seminars so on the street, on the bus, on yeah. the train, uh, the, 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 the resource that they are. Yeah. I, I visited you in Naples a couple of months ago, and I thought it was very strong when we came to your, your, your center and uh, you invited everyone. I think Jacob and, yes, Jacob and I, we came and you invited all of the, 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 the guys who was there, and we ended up in this huge circle of, <laughs> of people. And then you said, oh, you can tell the story, and you can tell the story. You didn't say that much yourself, but you gave so much room to all your, your, yeah, the, the young men that you had in the room. So I, I think that was a really nice way of also showing that you want to empower them. That was a, a way to with your presence uh, that you are in the, in the field in a way, mm. but uh, mm. for, for me it's important to give them the voice, give them their voice that, uh, as uh, Yunus said before, it's strange to be, to be Howardy for something that is so normal. And, and so now maybe it's not normal, mm. but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fundamental for our common wellness to, to, to share and to grow together and to give the opportunity to these young people to, to grow yeah. in our society, in our societies uh, to, to, to explain, uh, to, and now, yes, the narrative is, uh, is the worst that I never met before mm -hmm. in the last, uh, not only five years, but the last, I think, is, uh, 20 years, because for me, the, the Twin Towers attacks mm -hmm. was the, the changing of the narrative yeah. where the migration was linked to the security in a bad way. And yeah. we are still going down, 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 but we, uh, we don't stop to fight. No. I know it's been intense days here in Sweden, and uh, I also know that you really appreciate the problem solving workshop yesterday. I know that your problem solvers are very tough on you, and they had a lot of advice, and they, they pushed you. So, uh, so how do you feel the day after now, <laughs> after that discussion? I mean, I know that you were very positive. Yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. That was very important because uh, uh, our, our problems, I mean, my organization, but lots of our social uh, work uh, uh, is, the, is the, that we are too much engaged to do our uh, daily work uh, yes. uh, from legally, educational, training. Mm -hmm. And so we can't communicate uh, what we do, but mostly the importance of what we do, all the social operators in the world, I say, mm -hmm. because we come back to the, at a different level from uh, from, uh, from Istanbul, from Turkey, from Greece, uh, Italy, Spain, uh, all over uh, yeah. our continent, we, we need to communicate, to communicate, to help uh, to this communication, to build a new narrative. And uh, I think that starting from, also from this important moment that you are managing since mm. four, six, six years, mm. this is one of the way to continue to do. And so yeah. we have just to, continue to do what we are doing, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, please stay in the, in the sofa. We're going to invite your colleague, um, Lourdes. So let's see her film. Many unaccompanied migrant children arriving in Spain find their rights violated. The Spanish state attorney systematically refuses to accept children's identity documents issued in their countries of origin and instead determines that they are adults. As a consequence, these children are expelled from child care centers to the streets where they are exposed to serious threats, often causing their disappearance. Fundación Raíces, an organization co-founded by Lourdes Raizabal in 1996, helps children and youth to gain effective access to their rights, providing them with legal assistance, social support, and job opportunities. Lourdes is an extremely strong advocate for children, highly dedicated to the struggle against migration policies that violate their rights, ensuring that all children are protected. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of Fundacion Raices, Lourdes Reisabal.
Thank you very much, Lourdes. And thank you um, for being such an inspirational, um, in dedicating her whole life to this course. And you are such a role model for me and for, for all of us. And I know that you have prepared something that you would like to share with everyone here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We don't, don't, we don't have much time, and therefore, very grateful for this award, I will start by sharing the story of a boy. His name is Mamadou. He fled the war in his country, Guinea Conakry, when he was only 13 years old, after seeing how one night his parents and sister were killed. He suffered for two years to get to Spain. Once in Madrid, the embassy issued Mamadou's birth certificate and passport, certifying, certifying he was 15 years old. However, the prosecutor's office did not accept Mamadou's documents, as they usually do with all the accompanying migrant minors and was subjected to a genital and dental exploration right there in the prosecutor's office and then taken to a hospital to x-ray this wrist, after which the prosecutor decided, ignoring the birth date on his official documents, that he was 18. By making of age, Mamadou was left to suffer on the streets, helpless and abandoned without covering his most basic needs, without schooling, nor anything a child needs, but also without being able to work, because with his documents not having been invalidated, Mamadou was still a child. In Fundación Raíces, only in the past few years, we have helped over 900 children whose rights have been violated by the public administration, illegal repatriations, refusal to process residence and working permits, determination of the age without guarantees, leaving children on the street, being attacked in the shelters. The discrimination that these children suffer is terrible. 15 years ago, they were expelled to their country. Today, they are expelled onto the street of our cities, leaving them in the most absolute legal limbo. No administration questions the validity of passports and birth certificates of the embassies when it regards citizens of over 18 years old or when the children are accompanied by their families. It only happens when they are children who are alone. This award that I received today is not for me, not for Fundación Raíces. They deserve this award. Each and every one of the children who arrived to Spain, to Europe alone. I'm thinking of Mamadou, Saliu, Sadja, Anwar, Maimuna, Fatima, Sara, Raisa, and all of those who never reached us, who may already be resting in the Mediterranean Sea or suffering the consequences of the European policies that criminalized them and make them invisible until they disappear. They are the brave ones. They are those who risk their lives in search of a better life. And despite everything, they teach us that the life and dignity of human beings has no borders. Spain is a gateway to Europe. If Spain does not adequately protect the children who arrive, they will continue to try and find a safe place. But many children will, will be lost along the way. We cannot speak of a, safe, of a safe and peaceful coexistence for all unless it is without, with absolute respect of human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please get over.
As mentioned, the theme for this evening is children in the hands of Europe. And we have heard that what is now talk about how children are trafficked on the way to Europe and in Europe. But for some children, the journey search starts much, much earlier. It starts in sub-Saharan Africa or in other African countries. Children that are so desperate to escape, maybe hunger, lack of education or employment opportunities, that they really feel forced to leave their home countries. Sometimes it starts with the person you know who prey on your desperation, making false promises of employment or education here in Europe. And exactly what we have said a few times during this evening, there are no more uh, any legal ways to get to Europe. So that forces you that you need to put the faith in, in the hands of smugglers. In many cases, you will be forced to give your identity document away and put yourself in enormous debt to your smugglers, making yourself totally dependent on them. In some cases, it is not even a choice. You will have been sold to the smugglers, before the journey even starts, for the purpose to be exploded when you arrive to Europe. So, it begins. A journey outside all protection system, all alone. And this is the situation that some of the children in the hands of Europe are fleeing from. Luckily, there are people in the region fighting for the lives of the rights of these children. Exceptional individuals who have dedicated their lives and in many cases also risking their own lives and their own safety in doing this job to protect children. And they try to protect as many children as they can from falling into the hands of traffickers. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the time has come to introduce the last two Shaitan awardees of the evening. So sad and so unfortunately, they have not been able to come here in person because due to close borders, due to the increasing difficulties for people coming from countries in Africa to travel to Europe, even for this kind of occasions. They were not welcome and they were not allowed. So, of course, I wish I had Ragatou and Nandi here standing by my side to receive this award. But as you can all see, I'm standing here by myself. But luckily, they both have recorded a message. But first, we will see their films. So, let's listen to Ragatou. Guinea's geographical location, porous borders, poverty, and socio-political crises make it a point of origin and transit country for many irregular migrants. After many of her friends lost their lives crossing the Mediterranean Sea, Ruzia Tudialo decided she needed to do something. She founded the organization ADEPE, which provides children with vital information about the risks of migrating to Europe. By supporting children and young people to find safe places to stay in their home countries, she has contributed to saving thousands from these deadly risks. With her relentless devotion to helping these vulnerable children, her work has reached far beyond her country. 
Please welcome the founder of Adepe, Rujatu Diallo. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Rugia Tujalo. I really wish uh, I could be there with all of you tonight, but unfortunately, that was not possible. I'm, however, following the ceremony on the live stream. I want to thank so much for this award. Being a part of Chai 10 Awardees means a lot for me and my organization. So she's watching it on the live stream. So big applause for Margaret here. So she can hear us. And let's meet Nandi. Sierra Leone is a source, transit, and destination country for child trafficking. Far too often, family members, relatives, and friends take advantage of vulnerable young women and girls who are forced into sexual exploitation. Instead of receiving support, victims become stigmatized and isolated from society, stripped of any opportunity to complete their education or gain regular work. Nandi D. Zulu is the founder and executive director of Action Pro Sierra Leone, an organization created to combat child trafficking. Under her leadership, the organization has prevented many children from becoming exploited and abused and victims of trafficking. She is a humble and selfless leader focused on the well-being of her colleagues and her organization. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome the Executive Director of Action Pro Sierra Leone, Nandi D. Zulu. Hello, everyone. It's unfortunate I couldn't make it to the Child 10. Foundation Award Ceremony in Malmo, Sweden, yet I feel privileged to be given the opportunity by the Child 10 Awards Foundation to share our story. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I hope that you are also watching the, lead video, the link. So, Dear guests, we have now met all the 10 Child 10 awardees of 2020. And thank you, everyone in the room, coming here tonight and taking the time and also, I think, opening your heart to the stories that we have heard here tonight. As I told you in the beginning, that this evening was going to be a journey. For me, not only this evening, but the few past month working with these awardees has been a journey. A journey between hope and despair. I mean, it's hard to not despair when hearing some of the stories about children that we've heard tonight, including all the ones that you can read on the posters on the walls here, here at Morris Gun. I mean, we call them children in the hands of Europe. But actually, in reality, these are the children that we, the people of Europe, have taken our hands away from. Children that we have instead pushed into the hands of criminal traffickers, into lives consisting of abuse and exploitation. And we have done this by making the numbers in your passport more important than the facts that you are human, that you are a child in despite need of help. 
that we have made the system more important than human empathy. In order to deal with these problems, we need to see them. We need to acknowledge them and, close, and not close our eyes to them. But we also need to see there is hope. This hope can come from the awardees that we have met here today, the ones that are brave and persistent enough to follow their moral compass and do what's right, even if we know the price is high, who are dedicating to find new solutions when the official child protection system are broken, to fight towards changing the system instead of just hiding behind the system. Our awardees remind us of the difference that one single voice can make, that you can be the spark that ignites a movement if you are brave enough to use it. But they also remind us that being brave comes with a price, and that even the bravest of us need help to take the fight on. They need financial resources. They need political support. They need help to fight the ignorance, the indifference, the racism, the dehumanization that are spreading across our country, across the continent, and across the world. And I think that we are living in a time where fundamental human rights and values is being challenged, where basic ideas such as the equal worth of all humans is no longer given, where increasing polarization and divide, it divides us all, all the time. You need to take a stand for human rights and dignity and to show solidarity with the most vulnerable. So it's not easy. But let us gather and listen to the Child 10 awardees and what they think needs to be done. Let us take their challenge to us, to use the power that we, all the people in this room, have to make the world a more just one. And also always, always back the ones around you who take the fight when you feel that you can't. So with that, I would like to invite, for the last time this evening, our musical guest, Arne Brun. And this song is very special for me because this song highlights that no one should be left alone. Think I leave your side, baby? You know me better than that. You think I leave you down when you're down on your knees? I wouldn't do that. I'll tell you you're right when you. And if only you could see into me Oh, when you're cold I'll be there Hold you tight to me When you're on the outside, baby, and you can't get in I will show you you're so much better than you know When you're lost and you're alone You can't get back again I will find you, darling I will bring you home 
And if you want to cry, I am here to dry your eyes. And in no time, you'll be fine. You think I leave you sobbing? You know me better than that. You think I leave you down when you're down on your knees? I wouldn't do that. Oh, when you're cold, I'll be there. Hold you tight to me Oh, when you're low I'll be there By your side, baby Thank you. And the congratulations. So beautiful, Alana. <sighs> so, I mean, now we are coming. We are in the end of the ceremony. But we invite you all to, to stay afterwards. You will have the chance to talk and ask more questions to the awardees and mingle together and discuss this. I remember last year, I think many of us really felt strongly that we wanted to stay and sort of connect with each other and talk. So there will be some drinks and snacks and things. So please don't run away, stay for a while. I also, of course, want to take the opportunity together with Jacob to, to thank some people. We want to, of course, thank Altitude Meeting, who has helped us to organize this, and not at least Eileen, who's been working day and night the last couple of weeks. She's been doing a brilliant job. Thank you very much, Eileen. A huge applause, thank you. Um, and also, Soledad from Part of More, who has done this amazing installation with all the toys and gathered the whole com municipality. I think a lot of young people in the municipality to support us to paint the toys and bring them here and everything. So big thank you to you, Soledad. <laughs> and also Elise, Ida, me, Marlene, Marika, and the rest of our team. So huge thank you for all the help. And not least, also Jacob. <laughs> And all our, our partners, you see all of them there. And then, of, of, of course, also we would like to, to have a few tips and tricks how you can support the work that we do. Yeah, and uh, there are, of course, many ways that you can support uh, the ROD's work. Uh, you can support, of course, by a financial contribution. You have all the information in the pro program book you have. But you can also support with your expertise and knowledge and let us know how you, how you will be able and how you feel that you can support a specific organization or the course in general. But also support by sharing their stories, sharing their testimonies, and letting the world know what's actually happening in Europe right now. And I want you to do that not feeling as a supporter, because their fight, the fight of the ROD's, that is also our fight. All of us are a part of that solution. And I would actually like to ask you to bring this teddy bear that you have received on your share back home. And I want you to put it somewhere where you can see it. And I want you to read the quote from my children that is written on this teddy bear. And I want you to see this teddy bear and remind yourself that there are children right now in Europe, in Sweden, in your town, that are living totally invisible, exploited, and suffered from a lot of abuse. And I want you to feel that this is also my fight. This is also my responsibility. And I want you to start act from there. 
And to end this ceremony, I would like all the awardees to come up on stage, and I would like every one of you in the room to, to get up and honor them for the last time. So please welcome all the Child 10 awardees of 2020. Yeah, yeah, yes, you. Yeah, now it's time to go out, and there is a mingle outside, and we are open uh, at least an hour more. So please meet everyone outside. <laughs>